Okay, in this next video, we're going to look at factors that influence reaction rates, essentially what speeds reactions up. And there's a variety of different factors that the book outlines. So let's go over them one by one and just make a little list. So factors that impact reaction rates. And I'm going to just abbreviate reaction there. Makes it a little faster. All right, so the first one is a pretty big one. It's the nature of the reactants. And you might be wondering, well, that's kind of vague. What do they mean, the nature of the reactants? So, for example, ionic reactants versus covalent. If you have two ions, let's say an anion and a cation reacting, it's going to react very, very quickly because those opposite charges are going to attract them towards one another, right? Where you typically wouldn't see that as much with covalent molecules. However, we did see these intermolecular forces with covalent molecules. So in particular, we can also look at polarity. Really polar molecules tend to react more quickly than nonpolar molecules, again, because they tend to essentially be attracted to one another. Next thing we could look at is size. Size plays a really big role, so large molecules might have different reaction rates than small ones. And then the last one is surface area. And when I say surface area, what I'm really referring to is solids. And this can impact reaction rates very dramatically. In fact, here's a cool picture from the book. This is essentially um, coffee creamer. And if you light coffee creamer over here, you can catch it on fire and, you know, it burns a little and stinks. However, if you throw it up into the air and catch it on fire, it bursts into a big fireball. So if you're ever looking for an outdoor demo to do, this is one you definitely want to do in a uh, a lawn that's well watered, but it's a kind of flashy, fun demo for kids, especially. But that's because when you throw it in the air, you get a huge amount of surface area versus a clump just sitting in a bowl. All right, so number two is the concentration of reactions, reactants, excuse me. All right, and what does this mean? Well, essentially the concentration determines how much reactant is going to be uh, basically buzzing around, bumping into other reactants, right? So a reaction relies on collision. A higher concentration means that it's more likely to have a reactive collision. Okay, and I did want to briefly define this, and there's actually a different term that the book uses. Instead, what they call this is an effective collision. I've always heard of it as a reactive collision, but an effective collision is the same idea. An effective or a reactive collision is a collision that causes a reaction to occur. So it has the correct energy. And orientation. for a reaction to occur. All right, so let's take a look at some example situations here. And let's just take a really simple reaction. Let's just have A plus B combined to products. So this is more just a theoretical reaction. Well, in this reaction, we can see that A must bump into B and conversely, B must bump into A for this reaction to occur. So let's pull a figure from the book, okay? And you can see that if A over here bumps into A, that is not an effective collision, right? So A plus A equals no reaction. All 
All right, we rely on these other collisions to occur. That's A bumping into B. So in this case, we would get some probability of A colliding with B. However, down here, if we increase the amount of B in solution, we're also going to increase that probability. So higher concentrations equals higher probability of an effective collision. And that's true for both A and B in this theoretical example. All right, the next one after concentration of reactants is the temperature. And this is a big one. The temperature of the reactants. All right. And what this does is it increases the energy for collisions, right? So it increases the probability of effective collisions. And so you can think about these molecules kind of zipping around. If we heat it up, they're going to zip around faster. They're going to have more kinetic and internal energy, which increases the probability that a reaction will take place. The really interesting thing is scientists have measured this a fair amount, and the rate approximately doubles for every 10 degree um, Celsius temperature increase. So for example, if you run a reaction at 25 degrees Celsius, it might have one rate, but if you run it at 35 degrees Celsius, the rate will be double what it was at 25 degrees Celsius. All right, and then the last one is a big one. Last one is the rate can really be impacted by the presence of a catalyst. All right, so then the question is, well, what in the heck is a catalyst? Well, a catalyst is something that increases the rate of the reaction. And this is due to a lower activation energy. We'll take a look at that in a second. but is not consumed in the reaction. It's essentially a reaction helper, but it's not something that you have to add more of, right? If you put a little bit in, it'll just keep on getting regenerated over and over and over again as the reaction continues to cycle. So let's go back to this activation energy part, right? So we said that the reason it gets faster is due to this lower activation energy. So here's a nice energy diagram from the book. And you can see these two curves. So if we follow this, let me even draw over it. If you follow this line, right, this would be the uncatalyzed state in red. So what we're doing is we're essentially dropping the amount of energy required so that now it takes less energy to get over that little hill. So now we've got a much, much smaller catalyzed activation energy compared to the uncatalyzed activation energy. That speeds everything way up. All right, there's two different types of catalysts. There's a homogeneous catalyst. And you can probably tell by the name, a homogeneous catalyst is distributed evenly in solution. And then there's a heterogeneous catalyst. where these tend to be things that don't dissolve or disperse evenly.
Essentially, these rely on surface chemistry. I'm really not going to get into this, but if you think about a catalytic converter in your car, for example, right? The gases are going to go by the solid material. So this would be classified as a heterogeneous catalyst. And the whole purpose of a catalytic converter is to take some of these nasty gases and convert them more into inert gases that are less harmful for the environment. Um, so that would be a good example of a heterogeneous catalyst. Where a homogeneous catalyst would be something you could sprinkle into solution and it would essentially get dissolved in many cases. So you wouldn't even be able to see it as a solid. Again, this kind of gets back to homogeneous mixtures versus heterogeneous mixtures. All right, there's one last term I did want to bring up, and this is an inhibitor. And an inhibitor is essentially the reverse of a catalyst. It reduces the reaction rates. So a catalyst will speed up the reaction rate where an inhibitor will do the opposite. And you might be wondering, well, why would we ever add an inhibitor? Well, in some cases, an inhibitor is added to prevent a competing reaction, right? So maybe you've got, um, let's say, A plus B that could go to either C or under some conditions D. You might add an inhibitor to prevent this reaction pathway from taking place and favor the formation of this reaction pathway. I know it's a little abstract. The most common inhibitors are actually used to prevent what are called radical reactions, and they're reactions that really aren't covered in this book. Um, all right, that's pretty much it for this section. When we come back, we'll take a look at equilibria reactions and the position of equilibria.